Uh, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining. Uh, so I think today, um, uh, for everybody who was here yesterday, if you will recall, we kind of went over the technical aspects of computer science, uh, where we discussed techniques which help in um, enhancing privacy. And we went over topics such as encryption, digital signatures, a couple of dig, uh, data minimization techniques. We also discussed their feasibilities and constraints, so to speak. And uh, we had a short discussion on the corresponding hardware as well, facilitate uh, the kind of solution that we're trying to propose with this paper. Uh, so Malika, if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, today's conversation would be uh, revolving more around the regulatory context. Uh, we're going to uh, see how regulations evolving and shaping to accommodate this context. We'll move on to the failure of consent and uh, privacy self-management and why through this paper, and why we through this paper find the need to operationalize technically a standard for data protection. Uh, so then we'll be moving on to discussing the proposed solution of trusted executables along with the deep dive on some of the use cases which we discussed in the paper as well. Uh, so those would be the electronic health record system, uh, direct benefit transfer, and contact tracing apps. Uh, I think um, Srinivas has already put in the housekeeping rules, but if there are any questions, we'll kind of pause after every slide so you can just ask them. Or we can obviously have the steady stream of um, inputs coming in from the chat box. Uh, next slide, please. I think uh, just to jump in, uh, I think it's no secret that we as a society have been digitizing in the past uh, few decades. And um, we've been digitizing in all aspects of our life. But more importantly, states across the globe have either started to or enhanced public service delivery via digital channels. So we are now in the third generation of uh, data protection regulations. And as you will see in the graph, um, a lot of the regulation, uh, enhancements in uh, regulation for data protection that have taken place have happened in the last decade. Uh, so that's what you see in the um, last bar, so to speak. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here, I think what we're trying to say is that earlier we had a more uh, consent-based approach where uh, the idea was really to take consent from the data uh, principle of the data giver, individuals like you and I, and just kind of harvest it as the entity uh, collecting the data for fit. How, uh, what uh, countries across, across the globe are now moving to is more of an accountability-led approach, wherein the accountability not just lies uh, with the data entity that's collecting or processing data, but also with the regulator to kind of be on the wrap and Kind of see how the data and uh, data entity that's collecting data um, doing it and whether they're doing it in a lawful manner and there is kind of an accountability check for both the data entity and the regulator for keeping the data entity in check. Anubhuti, uh, it seems yeah. like you're not audible enough. Can you be a bit louder or come to the mic closer? Is this better? I think so, but I'll check back in a minute, but please speak a bit louder. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. So uh, when we talk about accountability-led approaches, where we no longer kind of just have the consent model in place, we take the consent from the individual, collect their data, and do what we want with it. Now there are um, kind of rights for the data subjects themselves. There is a uh, focus on the entities for uh, taking into account the uh, taking having cognizance of how and why they're collecting the data. So I think, um, as you'll see on the slide, the first three, which are related to rights for the data principles or the data subjects themselves, there are grounds of processing where the uh, collecting data entity would have to kind of establish the purpose for why they're collecting data. Uh, then there has to be specified purpose. There has to be uh, just one moment. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I hope the volume is now better. So as we were saying, uh, then the second about specified purpose where you kind of have principles as we went over yesterday with regards to the OECD principles for data processing. Uh, there has to be a collection limitation for the data you're collecting. There has to be purpose limitation. There have to be specified purposes and safeguards as to what 
an entity would do or have a general idea of what they're going to do with the personal data that they're collecting. The personal data that is collected, it has to be processed fairly throughout the life cycle, from the point of collection of that data, to processing of that data, to sharing of that data, and finally, if at all, deletion or archiving of that data. There's also a larger focus on organizational data practices. So it is no longer in silos where uh, entities are just collecting personal data. There is a kind of cognizance in the larger um, community uh, wherein uh, we understand that there are certain practices, certain standards of, standards of collecting data and processing it as well. And finally, um, just there is heightened accountability to the regulator for, um, uh, for kind of uh, uh, the manner in which they collect data and for the regulators themselves to monitor and supervise um, efficiently what it is that the data entities under them are doing. Uh, next slide, please. So as we discussed earlier about the consent model, despite having moved to uh, a more accountability-based uh, data protection regime uh, across, many, uh, across many such laws that have come into place, there still seems to be uh, this reliance on consent that constantly comes up. And uh, it's been established widely that asking for consent, asking a data subject at the spot whether they would agree to do away with their data for uh, a particular service. It's been established within literature that it is uh, largely meaningless and it only provides a false choice. So we've kind of provided the um, uh, research that is already available on this. But as we know, there's a lot of um, cognitive and behavioral biases that are operating at the level of the user when, um, when asked if they would be willing to share their data. Then um, even for the data entity that's asking for personal information, there appears to be an information asymmetry with the data principle or the data subject about what's going to happen with their data. And um, it's a widely understood um, uh, kind of fact wherein data and uh, data collecting entities themselves don't know how much further they are going to be able to process their data. So they might say today that we're only going to use it for X, Y, Z purposes, but tomorrow, um, there might just be a new use case for such data or a new technique which could yield more input from the same collected data. So there's just a lot of information asymmetry which uh, does not provide fair ground for a data subject to understand whether or not they should be parting away with their data. And finally, we constantly talk of this binary that is uh, that that's a problem with content. So it's either an accept or deny. And when you deny, um, Essentially, what you're saying is that uh, if you don't give me permission to access your data, you cannot really have my uh, uh, the service that I'm attempting to provide. So these are kind of the three uh, major uh, problems with consent itself. And uh, privacy self-management thus becomes very difficult through means of just uh, providing or modifying your consent. Uh, next slide, please. So I think with this, I'll just hand off to Malvika, but, I, uh, but just to round it off, we're trying to move away from this approach of taking consent for personal, uh, for uh, doing away or uh, giving your personal data to entities. And uh, while there are uh, noted problems with consent, there are also kind of, uh, there is a paradox with how um, data principles or data subjects perceive their own personal information and how they decide to control um, who they're going to share it with. And uh, this is Malvika here. Just a quick sound check. Uh, let us know in the chat if you can't hear me. Uh, but I suppose what we're doing here is uh, really stepping into the stage of the presentation where we are motivating the operationalization of the privacy guarantees that we are increasingly starting to see in the law. So as Anubhuti just mentioned, uh, obviously, the, I think there's widespread recognition that this idea that you can self-manage your privacy or your data through personal data stores and so on is only really relevant to a very small proportion of the population, if at all. Um, and the wider discourse, actually, in the early 2000s, later as well, has really focused on the fact that maybe people don't care about their data in that they state that they value their information. But when you're asking for the information, they pretty much say, I agree. I say they, and I mean we. Uh, 
Um, I think if you step away from that finding in kind of, uh, you know, behavioral economics and so on, uh, this paradox is really uh, contextualized against this reality that we have where you might, your stated preference might still be that you want to have some kind of control over how your information is shared. But given the operational architectures within which we are all currently living our lives, there's really not much we can do if we want to access a service. And this becomes even more um, of a problem, I think, and even more of a concern when we start thinking about the state providing services. And I think Arjun actually has a really interesting comment in the chat that I'll just address right here. Uh, this idea that you know people trade their information as an asset in return for services. In the early days of the internet, uh, this was very much the case. You had a small set of users often writing the terms of engagement as well. The thing is, as it's become almost a, a platform, the internet itself, in order to live our lives, we need to be able to access services through this platform. And there the power dynamic really shifts from, you know, a set of people operating at the edges of a system who have a lot of agency into say something like you have a public uh, distribution system for food, where unless you are able to prove that the information held about you in a database is accurate, uh, you cannot get food, right? And so that collision between the virtual world and the real world, I think, um, shows that this idea of trading information is really becoming quite obsolete in a, in a modern data-driven sort of society where um, we need to recreate what does agency responsibility and all of that look like online. And I think that's where uh, India has, you know, come into this entire debate, that early slide that Anubhuti showed you about, you know, since the 70s, we've been having laws, but we call them the first, second and third generation of data protection laws. It's really since 2010 that even countries and uh, jurisdictions like Europe, you know, where they had 30, 40 year old laws, everybody's rewriting their laws right now. And it's at that same time where we are becoming slowly by pull or push a digitizing society. And what we've recognized in our society is that uh, far away from data just being property that you can trade in return in a barter system, data has become, and that's, uh, sorry to be a lawyer here and put a lot of words on the slide, but I think the core of what we all now know as the Puttaswami judgment in 2017 really said each of us have an interest in preventing how information about us is collected, represented, and how it's disclosed. You know, um, the how it is disclosed to uh, national security apparatus might be different from how you want it to be disclosed to your ration shop, uh, to how you want it to be disclosed to your neighbors or your telecom providers. So we have an interest in having some control over that. But I think the dissonance comes from the fact that just because a lot of the databases themselves and the digital architectures are not things that we can control, we have this interest that we would like to assert but we are in some sense removed from the ability to control these vast, uh, you know, huge architectures. Now, this doesn't have to be too sinister, and I'm sure Prashant and Subodh and uh, Shubhashish will tell us more why, it, you know, it's actually great that we have these kinds of architectures in place to enable our lives. I think the, the short point here is how do we get to a point where we have a responsible system as a whole, because that notion of trading information has, has personal information has fallen away. And I think another great thing that's happened in India in the last three years and very, very quick uh, top level is that as a result of this interest or almost like a fundamental rights, human rights interest that has been recognized in your personal information in relation to yourself, uh, government has had to move to put in place a bill which actually gives you certain rights. So it kind of demarcates where you can trade in your data and what type of your data, especially if you're a child, for instance, um, are you simply not allowed to go out there and, um, you know, kind of trade in, especially if that is going to uh, expose you to certain risks and harms? And um, I think the last thing we'll say on this, just to tie it all together, is that on the one hand, we know that consent is failing as the internet gets wider and data-driven services even off the internet get more and more central to living your life in society. Uh, but equally, there's a need in the law to say, okay, if a one-to-one -one transaction doesn't work, let's put in place some accountability mechanisms where the people holding your data, you can interact with an expectation of trust 
right? And that they, you can think of them almost as a fiduciary or somebody who you are in a relationship of trust with, like a lawyer or a doctor or, um, you know, even a religious leader, where you can make yourself vulnerable because you know that you're going to get some support from them and they have a much higher um, uh, sort of knowledge base than you. And those responsibilities and expectations should operate irrespective of trust. So this is as far as the legal landscape has evolved. And we've kind of told you in like six minutes uh, what's happened over the last 60 years. Um, so happy to talk, pick this up more. But I suppose where that takes us is we have this law. At the highest level, it's saying, you know, we should have a responsible data architecture. What it means next is that that law itself, if and when it's passed by parliament, hopefully potentially in the next year, it will need to be made, it will need to be operationalized through something that we call subordinate legislation. I'm sure many of you know this already, but uh, the law just is a set of principles uh, for what you want to do. And this is a kind of very granular image from a policy brief we put out, but it tells you that there are about 70, 80 areas in which we'll have to operationalize the law. We'll have to say, what do we mean by data quality? What do you mean by data audits? What do you mean by, for instance, transparency measures, right? Uh, and all of these things will evolve. What is anonymization? And this is something we discussed yesterday. But as that's happening, one thing that's been clear is that if you don't have a technical operational standard as well, along as a legal operational standard, you end up in a situation where you have lots of wonderful motherhood and apple pie legal statements around interests, human rights, uh, respect. But in practice, there isn't really very much enforcement of those guarantees. And I think that's the reason why the IIT Delhi team and us really have been having this conversation for more than a year now and resulted in this paper that I will hand over to Shubhashish and Prashant to talk to us more about. But we really see the motivation, all of this is the motivation for the reason why we need a technical operating standard for any data protection regulation. Uh, this standard we're going to talk to you about, or this architecture, is not about substantive legal protections, right? That we'll have to come to as a society. Do we want to give notice to everybody or not? Should everybody receive a breach notification or not? Those are uh, value decisions we'll come to as a society. But once that happens, and it might happen in the next year, so this is really pathbreaking times to be living in, what happens to, what can we do next to ensure that it's made operational, the detailing is made with some kind of a connection between computer science and law, because often the disconnect or the inability to talk across disciplines creates all these weird rules which make no sense in practice. And secondly, how can we actually tell that it's being enforced? Because again, it comes down to how much can the regulate to have as oversight over data processing entities and how can data pro processing entities have a conversation with the regulator that is tech mediated and you don't have to perhaps you know download something in paper and sign it in triplicate or you know such arcane things as we are used to in our culture um, and that's the role of this so on that note if there are any questions otherwise i'm just going to hand over now to shubhashish and to prashant to come in and do the deep dive of the op uh, of the architecture and the operationalization itself based on our conversation yesterday uh, malavika before we move on to the next set of conversation maybe let's just take a break and let people have any questions or a discussion with you and An Anubhuti? Is that good? Sure, yeah. Uh, anyone who has any points to be raised, please go ahead, raise your hands. I'll unmute your mic and you can speak. Okay. Uh, on this question of urgent point, essentially that you tried to explain itself, right? This a trade of data, and and especially this dichotomy of consent being tied, but uh, but you're still being forced onto it, and this new models of that are emerging, like data trust, personal data stores. Uh, frankly, India has adopted it, but there is no definition for these, right? Like inside the government, you see. For example, the RBI doing account ag aggregators, which is being shown showcased as a, a regulatory sandbox or a, a data stewardship model. But we really do not have these definitions inside the government. Uh, while you are advocating for some of these systems through your paper, uh, a lack of uh, uh, regulative clarity itself is something which is confusing around these systems, right? 
so what would be what do you think needs to be done on that front even in terms of say consent yeah i mean one good thing is if if we have a horizontal law uh, like you know one legislation and very quick uh, sidebar is that when you have conflicting laws there's a general rule that the legislation or statute uh, the constitution is supreme then any standalone statute which is cross sectoral is supreme and then specific regulations that might come under that statute or from a regulator it comes next so there's almost like a trumping if the constitution trumps a bad statute the ba- uh, statute trumps a bad regulation and so on so if we get this pdp bill then it will trump in some sense or they we will have to renegotiate all these other uh, existing sort of one offs that we have and that's a project also that we're looking at is that you know can these other you know the digital payments uh, localization directive for instance from the rbi is that consonant with this regulation so that's just to answer the point about how everything isn't really coherent um i think the larger question just about uh you know if you, if there is a person and they want to use these data stores or account aggregators or digi lockers that's all very well um and that's great but the point is in our uh, kind of society and across the world as well the actual usage of these has been low because it requires very high bandwidth for instance if you know if you're a daily wage laborer who is currently battling life because of the lockdown and loss of livelihood you're not going to be sitting around fiddling on a you know screen about your digi locker right i mean it's not no offense it's a great system but it needs that level of bandwidth so as a consequence can we move to a situation where people who want to do privacy self management can but even for those who don't we have a responsible architecture overall where a regulator is able to say when data is collected how it can be used and how it should not be used um the question around value i'll just quickly tackle these two and then hand over cuz i don't want to uh, go on for too much longer uh, on value of data is a very difficult question um the trading argument was never really based on the fact that you could put a rupee value or a dollar value on information or your personal information and the reason for that at a very high level is that personal data can't be treated like property because it doesn't uh, satisfy the conditions of property legally speaking this goes back to our conversation around logic and so on yesterday but essentially there are some conditions on the basis of which something fits or does not fit property two of the main ways data is not property is that it's not alienable for property uh, take your house or even a pen that you want to sell anyone you should be able to cut it off and pass it on to someone and then you have no connection with it the thing with personal data is no matter who you pass it on to any change to that data has to reflect you and if it's mis you know if it's misused or misrepresented then you have negative effects as well so the alienability fails that condition and then i think there are several other conditions based on even intangible property like copyright and so on it's not an artistic work right it's not a literary work it's literally a representation of you it's an extension of yourself and that's why it's not property because when it's your own personhood then it becomes something that is outside the realm of property i hope that wasn't too philosophical but it's actually quite a practical reason why um there are some certain uh you know conditions in which you could trade trade your information potentially uh, it's not to say that you know when we're talking about data we need to get granular as well all personal data has to have you need to have go down a level so obviously you don't want genetic information or certain types of information that is contextually private uh, if to be revealed against the person's wishes uh in some cases there may be somebody who wants to trade particular types of um, information about themselves like for instance you want to get on a, a, a you know a matrimonial site in india we have a lot of those and we're actually putting our data into a closed market in order for others to see it and price accordingly to use some um, uh, not appropriate language i suppose uh in those cases we can put in place a contract and i like to use the analogy and this is the last time i'll use an analogy because they never work for data but it's kind of like labor they we say bonded labor is not all right but that doesn't mean you can't get into employment contracts contracts right and it's labor is an extension of yourself in some sense uh so you can buy and sell people that's just not okay um but we arrived at that point as a society and i think we are kind of witnessing the creation of those kinds of frameworks for data as well 
There's one question before we move on. Uh, I think uh, Abhishek has it. I'm unmuting him. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, this is Abhishek. So I basically work with uh, uh, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs uh, at the Smart Cities Mission, and I'm also a data scientist. So uh, on the point that you were making that the government is actually, uh, you can say, uh, not working towards them. So I would like to like point out that a government is working towards them, but uh, it's kind of very vague right now. Uh, so, for example, uh, at the ministry level, we are actually working on uh, city data policy, which is sort of backed by uh, government of India's open data policy, which only talks about uh, non-sensitive data. We are trying to include sensitive data and then trying to figure out a way to maybe deal with uh, personalized data and how to anonymize data, uh, which is fit for consumption by even private entities, something like that. Uh, so that, th those sort of like initiatives are going on even... Uh, for example, like METI is also working on the similar initiatives, which they like they are trying to standardize these things through BIS. Uh, they are not on like they are sort of in a closed system right now, and like the community does not know about them. I think that's the biggest problem that government has right now that they don't sort of open up everything. It is very closed in the ecosystem. Uh, but but there are some initiatives, and uh, I think on the private side. Uh, uh, like uh, you might have heard about the streamer based system and uh, they have come up with a new framework which are called data unions which try to uh, like, like which gives you sort of like a framework to sell your personalized data in real time uh, which is totally anonymized and that's sort of something very amazing uh, so uh, yeah that's it that's the point i actually wanted to make thank you uh, i I, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but there are a lot of updates on the front of the National Urban Innovation Stack where there are upcoming standards on data exchange systems. We will get on to that on a different session probably. Uh, I do have more hands. Malavika, should I take them? I mean, we're here to answer. I'm just conscious yeah. of uh, time, so it depends. I think we, yeah, have, we, we have time. It's just 4.30. Uh, I, I will let them uh, uh, ask them to keep it brief. Arjun, uh, you can go ahead, but just make it brief. Yeah, and this is pretty much uh, on the lines of uh, how data and plays out as asset or not asset. So I put the question in the chat as well. If I was to create content which was, say, a fake profile online, that would be copyrightable as far as I understand it, right? Not necessarily, no. So yeah, I mean, that's probably the, the broader sort of uh, thought experiment that I'd like to go into it, but I don't think this is probably the best time to do it. But I would probably think on those lines because content is traded all the time. It's considered an asset. Uh, I don't see the dichotomy between the two realistically. So I'd li like to get the operationalization on that understood a little bit. Sure. And actually, I, I've been working on this uh, kind of paper forever, which hopefully will see the light of day this year. Uh, but just to kind of the headline there is when it's uh, when it becomes prof a profile creation of a profile, uh, it is not necessarily it's not an artistic work. Uh, it's actually think of it more like misrepresentation. And this is kind of what Twitter and Facebook are going through right now. So it's that line between, you know, if you if you're an imposter, say if there's Arjun 2 who's walking around and kind of entering into transactions for you, uh, that person might say, actually, you know, I did all this effort to get into disguise and I, I'm an artist. It still does. It's not kosher in our society, but I'm happy to have a more technical conversation on, on that separately as well. Okay. We have someone else. Uh... Yeah. Uh, this is Suhan uh, Srinivas. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes, please go ahead, Suhan. Yeah. So uh, the question as to, uh, you know, Mal Malvika, I just wanted to the fact that it doesn't reflect natures of property is uh, something that could be taken care of in terms of the rights that you define uh, and create uh, as a derivative of data. So, for example, say property uh, has things like easementry rights, but say, for example, the ownership doesn't necessarily change and is always tied into whoever has ownership on the underlying property, but rights of how other people can utilize it get uh, you know defined through these other types of derivative rights that we have on property and that could be one model for looking at data uh, the continuing safeguard uh, that one perhaps could keep for the person whose data is being shared is to look at personhood as a framework because 
the idea of tradability and a financial value uh, perspective uh, may not be something that's universally acceptable to lots of people. Whereas if we were to say uh, personhood, autonomy and choice, which are basically fundamental uh, values or rights uh, that uh, are due to every human being and we keep those as the essential features for, uh, that the legal system protects and everything else is then derived thereof and the way that you, if you want to trade or not trade are based on uh, a system of rights and uh, interests that you create that ensure the protection of this. Uh, we could actually come up with a framework even if it doesn't uh, per se look like property or have the features of property. I mean, your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so obviously this, uh, I would say the, the, the kind of state of the art thinking of this, I, I really highly rate a Jew, uh, academic called Korean Prince, whose works out of Tilburg, excellent writing on this, and basically very detailed arguments of why um, these kinds of Kosian property rights frameworks don't, uh, they kind of break down. So there's been an interesting amount of work. So even things like easement, because people have tried that. The issue there is overall, the problem is um, the question of, do you want to monetize your data? I, th I think what is driving the view towards property mm. propertization? And yes. the question, I think the response to summarize a whole bunch of scholarship is that you could, if there is such a need, and hello to the doggy, uh, <laughs> if there is a need, <laughs> If there is a need to propertize, uh, to monetize data as a country or as people, you know, yeah. depending on, you could do that. Likely property is not the best route because it falls down on the basis that it's very hard to hold on and alienate beyond a point. And also, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Because it's the, uh, the tradability piece is more of the American data brokerage model that came about as opposed to say the European and other models that look at the human being perspective and the autonomy personhood piece and in that it fails but if we have to create an economic framework for it where governments necessarily want to trade we would perhaps need to come up with new forms of uh, instruments that uh, you know maybe retain what is essential in what we are trying to protect as outcomes but allow some degree of negotiation either for the state or private entities that the state allow uh, to engage with that individual's uh, data. Yeah, and the only other thing I would say there is uh, the uh, other side of this piece, if you take away uh, the propertization, is the effects it has upstream on competition and also um, kind of state versus private sector negotiations. Now, mm. there's been a lot of really interesting work uh, in uh, economics, actually, and labor markets, everything, which says that Every, the, the issue with sort of large data aggregator firms is that they tend often to a natural monopoly, which, mm. which actually puts you in a pretty difficult equilibrium if you try to trade with them. Because for every additional piece of data that Google has, the value that they would derive from that is very different from what a you know, startup might. I mean, potentially, yes. you, you could have equal computing, but if they're on the realms of whatever quantum computing right now, it's just mm. simply not a... Uh, you would never get to a point where there would be a level playing field. So I think the idea of that kind of harvesting also is slowly, I think some governments are beginning to see that it might not be the best way to protect government interests. Now, I guess the other discussion and Srinivas, maybe you should have a totally different session for this. Is just where does that leave the individual? What's interesting is that the US has taken a very markets first approach. Some say uh, not always the case based on which sector. Uh, and EU clearly has human rights imperatives. In India, is this really becoming a conversation about the state negotiating with the private sector about what value can be extracted from its citizens? Um, and it, that's fine, but then where is the citizen in all of this is, is an important question to ask. I think our framework of legislation has actually sacrificed the citizen. Because if you see the fact that the rights are completely being negotiated by the authority and even allowing you to know that there's a breach uh, and your ability to prosecute being limited is, I think, uh, the fact that the state has like, removed the focus of the citizen and not taken a human rights uh, or even a fundamental rights framework as per our constitution in the way that it's not kept the citizen at the center of it. Yeah, I guess you're right there, Sushant. So we'll have to, again, agree yeah. with Malavika. We need a separate session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This. another session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're going to do them as 
August, I guess, will be the third year anniversary of right to privacy judgment. We will try to line up a set of events. But I think we can move ahead now uh, towards uh, Professor Banerjee's and Prashant's uh, side of uh, event. Uh, shall I stop share right now, Shibashish? Just let me know, or if you'd like to stay on this slide. Yeah, maybe I can share uh, just two slides. Uh, uh, share screen. So is that visible? Uh, yes. Um, okay, so... Um, yeah, let's come back to the architecture uh, aspect of, uh, you know, the privacy of design architecture. And I'll just motivate that uh -huh. why proposing the architecture in the first place, right? And uh, uh, why is it necessary? So I will uh, start off from um, Prashant's slide yesterday, where uh, he tried to list out some necessary conditions for privacy. I have just added uh, some implications in bold. So Prashant mentioned yesterday that uh, absolute privacy is impossible, right? So which means that uh, if an adversary has unbounded access to unbounded auxiliary information, then there can be no bound to inferential privacy. There is no way to guarantee that what the adversary will find out if the adversary has the data in hand. Right? So uh, as an example, if the TRI chief says that uh, you know, here is my Aadhaar card, do what you can with it. Or if the UIDI chief says that, here is my transaction log, uh, authentication log metadata, uh, do what you can with it. Those statements are fundamentally flawed because an unbounded adversary can have unbounded harm uh, with, with, with that data. And this is well known. This is a theorem by Cynthia Dwok that uh, Prashant quoted. And, uh, and it suggests that you cannot let, so this immediately implies that you cannot let an adversary have access to the data itself. If the adversary has access to the data, unencrypted data, then the harm that the adversary can cause can never be bounded. Right? So, um, and this is also, uh, so, so, so this requires access control. So data has to be access control. And um, this is, and also encryption doesn't solve it because uh, encryption has a key management problem. Um, you know, who has the key has the decryption. And if an authority that is uh, encrypting the data and authority has the key, then an insider attack problem. So almost all attacks are insider attacks. You know, it's sort of uh, unthinkable in modern days that you will uh, attack a uh, modern data store from outside. You'll get caught in minutes. Uh, it's far easier to bribe somebody or threaten somebody, you know, an insider to, to get an attack. You know, uh, think of Snowden. So, um, in view of the insider attack problem, encryption doesn't give you any protection at all. So um, one requires access control and the access control will have to be enforced. It cannot be enforced by the data controller uh, simply because insiders in the data controller are what you want to protect against, right? So what is the requirement that the data cannot be accessed without authorization? Uh, with a purpose violation and this almost necessitates an uh, online regulator to affect that access control. The access control can be affected only by an independent third party uh, which monitors it and which has got an oversight. And this oversight cannot be offline. If the oversight is offline, then the data controller is unrestricted and uh, there is no way to do a privacy protection theoretically. So it's absolutely impossible. So, uh, so this necessitates an online regulator. And an online regulator, moment you have an online regulator who is physically separated from the data controller, uh, you have to bring in this notion of remote execution. So these are, uh, you know, straight implications uh, of uh, impossibility of absolute privacy and, uh, uh, and protection against insider attack. 
Prashant also mentioned about um, um, purpose limitation. The data controllers must declare purpose operant and mechanism should exist only to allow computation that fulfill the stated purpose. Now again, uh, the problem with data is function clip. Right, and um, this is an obvious problem that you, uh, you know, I think uh, Srikanth has uh, put up a comment out there saying that there are some stated purpose and there's some unstated purpose and purpose keeps on expanding. And this is the biggest privacy risk, you know, so uh, Cambridge Analytica and so on and so forth. So, so purpose limitation, purpose violation can happen in two different ways. One is a direct purpose violation. Uh, use the data directly for surveillance of uh, uh, you know, putting a tab on somebody and so on and so forth. Uh, there are indirect violations through artificial intelligence programs. You know, so um, you discover things about uh, personal identifiable information that you did not intend to, and that's also a purpose violation, right? Or um, you know, you can also end up doing discriminatory processing unknowingly. Um, you know, for certain communities, groups, individuals, and so on and so forth. So those are all uh, come, under the, come under the ambit of purpose violation. And uh, so if the data controller must declare the purpose up, up front and there has to be a mechanism to allow computation that only fulfill the stated purpose, this almost all automatically suggests pre-audit, right? Pre-audit of code, pre-audit of algorithms. Um, now this cannot be done Automatically, unfortunately, you know, nobody can do a static analysis of an AI program. So this has to be a best effort offline pre-audited uh, analysis that a regulator must do and the regulator capacity has to be built up if you ever want to build national scale systems. So uh, these executables or these uh, programs, uh, the, 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 the programs that will do the data processing they have to be pre-audited, signed, and sealed off by a regulator. And uh, thereafter, they have to have untamperability guarantees, um, both, the, both the programs and the data types they work on, right? This is the only way to um, prevent uh, purpose extension and purpose violation. And also the regulatory boundary must exist to as devices. For example, uh, you may define purpose limitation and build an electronic health record and put uh, you know, purpose uh, limited processing requirement on the on Métis or whoever is maintaining the data. But ultimately the data will have to go to a doctor's terminal. Um, you know, your electronic health record is useless unless the doctor can access it. And a doctor can then save it on his hard disk and sell it off. So the regulatory, so the doctor's device cannot be outside a regulatory boundary. And if that happens, then purpose limitation cannot be, cannot be implemented, right? So the regulatory boundary must access must must extend always to S devices also. The third uh, necessary condition that Prashant mentioned yesterday was legitimate purpose depends on dynamically changing concept. So there are um, you know certain authorization and access pattern that happen using static rules. Like uh, for example, uh, you know there are static rules about income tax. There are certain uh, static rules about health. If a doctor diagnoses something, there is some static set of tests that must follow and so on and so forth. So there are a static set of rules. But also there are dynamically changing levels of consent, approvals and authentication constantly. You know, for example, if I go to a doctor, I have to give consent for the doctor to access my data. Um, right? And these are dynamic things. So this architecture must support very high speed dynamic consent and approval architecture. Right? So there has to be a static part, there has to be a dynamic part. So that's also a necessary condition. And finally, that any time the data leaves the regulatory boundary, uh, you know, goes out and the data is data is disseminated in some form, then appropriate data minimization uh, is necessary. And uh, you know, one has to be very specific in this requirement. You know, one cannot say anonymization, as we saw yesterday. That has no meaning, right? Anonymization in computer science is understood to be a faulty concept. So uh, data minimization, depending on the use case, you know, you have to bring in anonymous credentials, you have to bring in virtual identities, you have to bring in, you know, for KYCs, you have to see what is the minimum disclosure that is necessary for KYC. For example, uh, you know, I 
should be able to just say that I have a valid driving license without showing it and showing my disclosing my name. If I'm caught on a traffic violation rule, if a policeman stops me on the road, I should be able to prove that I have a valid driving license but without, without disclosing my name, age, and, and so on and so forth. So these are standard techniques in computer science have been there for decades, 40 years. And uh, these have to, have to come in uh, for the various data minimization techniques. We would also like to argue that access control, remote execution, online regulators, and purpose limitation is the key to privacy protection. So once you have this, uh, it is also sufficient. So you don't ever allow any processing that exceeds the stated purpose, right? And you don't allow any unauthorized access whatsoever. And this is controlled online, right? So you require proofs that an authenticated entity is accessing and the authenticated entity, even after taking the data, cannot exceed purpose, right? So we would argue without giving a proof because this is too difficult to give a proof that this is not only necessary, but also sufficient. And I think that through the next 30, 40 minutes, Prashant will illustrate this with case studies um, as it goes on. So, uh, you know, our paper has a very complicated message. Um, and uh, so why have we written the paper at all? You know, the paper does not suggest uh, immediately a practical implementable architecture, right? So that will have to slowly come. Um, so this is more of a concept of what is required and uh, not a solution that can be implemented straight away, right? So we have messaging for diverse groups. So we are messaging for CS researchers, um, you know, like such as myself or Prashant or Subodh or uh, so on and so forth. And I think our messaging to them is that think of privacy not in terms of crypto SGX encryption. Uh, this is not the way to think of privacy the way we have been traditionally thinking. Think of privacy in terms of Putto Swami, Putta Swami 1, not so much Putta Swami 2. You know, don't ever think that way. Uh, Warren and Brandis, Salo, uh, you know, in fact, the architecture that we'll present uh, is very strongly motiv motivated by Solo, Daniel Solo's, uh, uh, the digital person. Uh, you know, he almost suggests this architecture without giving out the details. And uh, we have operationalized uh, some of those ideas. So think architecturally and fill up the gaps, right? So wherever this architecture that we'll present will have implementational gaps and it's for the CS researchers to work on. Our message for CS developers, also government, you know, big time for the government, all of the above. And phrases like best encryption, industry best practices, data is safe, unhackable, 100% secure, privacy by design, these words have no meaning, right? They are meaningless words. And they should and do erode confidence. So anonymization, uh, you know, each of these will have to be qualified always, right? Um, unhackable is an undecidable concept. Whether something is hackable or not is undecidable, right? It's a, it's recursively enumerable without being recursive. And hence, it's, it's an invalid question in the first place. Nothing ever is 100% secure. Uh, privacy by design, you know, whatever it does mean, you know, my says Aadhaar is safe because it's we have privacy by design. You know, these... These are not the vocabulary that should be used in the context of privacy. So when we talk about privacy of design, as we do, we will qualify it over the next 40 minutes with, a, with an architecture and of what we mean. Uh, and our message for the policy and legal folk primarily, I think, is that, that we do need operational standards against which public services must be uh, measured must be held up to, you know, we need definite standards for evaluating things like say Aadhaar, the public credit registry, uh, electronic health record system, uh, uh, DBT system. Uh, so there are, there are, there are, you know, so obviously when you build such a thing, there are politics, whether, you know, in, in deciding on the utility, whether you need to build such a thing at all, right? I think that what we are saying kicks in after you have decided that such a thing has to be built. Whether that such a thing will have to be built or not is a larger question. But once you have decided that such a thing has to be built, there are certain operational standards for privacy that are, that are required. And if you don't have these operational standards, you will not be able to measure to what extent an implementation proposal uh, meets privacy, you know, in a, in a, in a legal uh, or, an, or an ethical sense. 
and uh, the proportionality analysis will almost always be incomplete you know especially the balancing part because um, you know unless you sort of quantify you know in some ways um, the extent to which you can protect privacy um, the utility versus privacy balancing will almost always be vague as we saw in the putteswami 2 judgment right i mean it, it, it was random different judges said different things they interpreted things in a completely different way and we argue that such a thing will continue to happen so i'll stop here i'll give uh, with this introduction with this motivation of why we are proposing a particular architecture i'll hand it over to prashant to actually present that architecture. thank you so i'll stop sharing the slides and uh, yes if there are any questions on this i am happy to uh, anyone has any questions on any of the statements made by professor benerji uh, i see one hand okay uh hello chinmay is that you can you yeah that's yeah. me that's me okay. hi um so i just had a question about one statement you made uh, prashant and that was about the fact that this concepts of privacy of my design or uh, anonymization or any of those concepts have no meaning are you specifically referring to these uh as defined by a certain group or are you talking about this as generic principles of privacy internationally because you know, i want to understand what's your context of speaking think, no so i think that uh, you know uh, anonymization in particular what we what we talked yesterday that anonymization by default have to be assumed the null hypothesis is anonymization is always breakable you know there are theorems to that effect that it is almost impossible to anonymize except in some very very special cases right uh, so whenever you say anonymization those special cases will have to be brought in in a generic you know in a generic case there are no way data can be anonymized um, uh, you know any statistical data that you anonymize more often than not uh can be de anonymized with relative ease so so similarly you know when you are talking about uh privacy by design the privacy by design will have to be qualified in terms of what aspects are you talking about are you talking about a statistical uh privacy protection are you talking about a privacy protection of personally identifiable information are you talking about purpose limitation are you talking about access control are you talking about inferential privacy are you talking about differential privacy so i think that uh, you know it is data so data processing has certain algorithmic consequences right and those algorithmic consequences are reasonably well understood and um, you know for example it is well understood that if i give you the data if i hand over the data then i will never be able to put a bound on what you can do with the data you will almost always you know so if you are an unbounded adversary you will be able to do almost anything with the data right once i once i give it to you so what harm will come to the data cannot be determined a priori right so uh, as can i come in here please yeah. prashant yeah the thing is that you are making a blanket statement that these designs are, uh, these principles are useless but honestly these are principles to be followed by people who build the systems they are principles in the sense of principles they don't need in detail definition so i strongly think that uh, this is not uh, something that i agree with uh, there are like you yourself said i understand anonymization there is enough research to say that it's hard to do anonymization but still there are differential principles there are there is theory around a lot of how much um, anonymization can be done to an extent 
So they, these are all principles in the sense you can interpret in ways, uh, in different ways. I end, and I agree with you on that. But I wouldn't blanketly state that these are useless principles. No, so, you know, you're misunderstanding. When I say they're useless, I would say that just saying anonymization is useless unless you qualify it. So if you are talking about anonymization in a specific context and you show that that anonymization holds, then of course it is useful. Hmm. Right? But if you just say that my system is safe because I have anonymized data, you know, I think that you will go wrong more often than you will go right. So I am saying that any architecture that you do okay. requires you to be more specific, more precise. But that's also dependent on systems, right? Uh, they don't. Uh, and that's why we're saying that what are the principles that you have to uh, uphold when you're building systems? Right? Yeah, exactly. We'll so, come back to this you. again. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to hold you there. We'll come back to this again because I believe Prashant is going to explain some part of it again today. Principles and how he intends to operationalize it. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we see a oh. data controller. Um, so, okay, so um, building on uh, um, Professor Banerjee's explanation uh, and the motivation of why we need an operational architecture. Um, basically, I'm uh, presenting, uh, trying to illustrate our to an electronic health record example. And uh, again, this should not be seen as we are proposing how to do electronic health records, but just uh, as an illustration of the architecture itself. Um, so uh, just without going into the notation initially, uh, what's the workflow we are trying to uh, illustrate here is that uh, um, you have a patient who, uh, who gets an approval to get an MRI from a doctor and he gets an MRI done, uh, and that MRI goes to a database. Uh, later on, he goes to uh, some other doctor who uh, fetches the MRI information from the database and uh, um, prescribes medication um, and whatnot. Uh, and separately, you have uh, another path where uh, um, you are trying to do some kind of uh, um, disease analytics or epidemiology um, and uh, this is the machine learning uh, part of it and uh, is a statistical analysis uh, uh, path. Uh, and so clearly, uh, like we discussed uh, yesterday, there are um, privacy concerns here. For example, uh, the doctor may sell your medical data from here. Uh, you may have uh, um, uh, inferential privacy losses from uh, the analyst here and in general uh, from both of these uh, uh, agents you can have uh, um, purpose violation uh, uh, purpose violation either automatically or manually and uh, the same is true for any other uh, um, kind of uh, system in, a, in between uh, basically, any insider who has access to either the database or uh, the program accessing the database can actually um, uh, steal your secrets and um, uh, given that they have the right kind of uh, access uh, to the database, uh, your privacy is actually just uh, on the mercy of how well uh, the data controller has protected the database, right? Uh, and we are trying to provide an architecture uh, which protects against these kind of privacy risks. Um, so the key, um, uh, key uh, primitive we are using uh, here is uh, called a, a trusted executable or a TE, uh, which is uh, essentially just an abstraction of um, an environment or a program which basically uh, gives you the uh, secure remote execution kind of guarantees, which we talked about yesterday. Um, and essentially what that means is that this program is a box, is an isolated box. And whenever this program runs, its uh, confidentiality is protected, meaning uh, any of its intermediate or output uh, data is 
is not to uh, entities unless the program is explicitly instructed to do so. Um, it also protects uh, integrity, which means uh, that while the program is running, nobody can um, tamper the execution of the program. Uh, and um, basically, this program is uh, uh, approved by a regulator. So, uh, and this is the uh, this is the point where uh, the um, regulatory uh, regulatory capacity comes in. Um, so basically, uh, the idea is that if you, as a data controller, want to do some processing, you upload these programs as candidate programs to a regulator, and the regulator analyzes them, uh, analyzes the utility of those programs, analyzes the privacy risk associated with those programs, and if it feels that uh, it is appropriate, it allows you to execute these programs, right? Uh, these programs do live in the uh, physical infrastructure of the data controller itself. So they don't uh, live in uh, the physical infrastructure of the regulator itself, but uh, they are actively controlled by the regulator. And that is represented by this uh, valve kind of symbol, uh, which is uh, meant to denote uh, a flow control valve. Uh, and it is essentially controlling the flow of information uh, along each of these channels. Right? So I'm denoting them by ACR, meaning it's access controlled by a regulator R. Right? Uh, so, um, uh, and uh, this ER uh, represents that the data on this channel is uh, uh, encrypted uh, and this encryption is controlled by the regulator. So the regulator, when it decides, will give access to uh, the TEs and when it does not decide, it does not give access to the TEs. Um, and uh, these DT1, DT2, uh, all of these things uh, just basically represent different data types which flow across these channels. So for example, this uh, DT1 here, uh, where the MRI fetches information from the database uh, represents uh, the age of the patient. Uh, the patient is represented by uh, X. So uh, DT1 of X represents age of X, uh, sex of X, and the medical history of X, uh, which will perhaps be uh, useful while uh, doing some processing on the MRI. Right. So uh, the key idea is that um, we have this kind of uh, um, remote uh, um, authentication property. And we talked about this uh, in the context of uh, Intel SGX uh, yesterday. Uh, and it was called remote attestation, where uh, programs can uh, prove to a remote entity that uh, this is running uh, or rather the hardware can prove to a remote entity that uh, a particular uh, given program is running. Uh, it is running within an enclave and uh, um, it will, uh, the hardware will protect the confidentiality and integrity during runtime. Uh, so that process of uh, authenticating remotely is uh, what is described here during uh, the regulatory access control. So, uh, once the regulator uh, uh, is convinced that uh, the data is going to uh, this given uh, trusted executable and will be uh, processed in a certain way, uh, then the regulator can, um, can basically open up this wall and allow uh, this decryption of uh, this data uh, to happen within the TE, right? Uh, and that is the general uh, approach. Uh, now, of course, uh, the regulator's decision of uh, whether, uh, whether something is uh, legal or not depends on a lot of factors, not just uh, what program you are running, but also uh, on uh, perhaps on um, whether you have appropriate consent from patients. And we have um, argued that consent is not enough, uh, but it is nevertheless uh, one of the contributing factors towards the regulator's decision-making process. Uh, the regulator may also uh, require that you have uh, the necessary approvals from the doctors uh, or in some other cases from uh, other appropriate authorities. Um, it needs to see that uh, whoever is accessing the data finally uh, they have the proper credentials and whatnot. Uh, 
uh, and in the process of doing so the regulator uh, will need to talk about talk to a separate identity authority which uh, provides uh, this information to the regulator and uh, um, again in a similar uh, privacy controlled way uh, and so this is the rough uh, uh, overall architecture uh, of how uh, the data controller and the regulatory access control uh, uh, we want to uh, um, basically zoom in to the regulator itself um, with respect to what kind of architectures the regulator would need to uh, implement on its own end to enable this. And uh, um, that brings me to um, figure two. Uh, so here you see that the uh, central uh, job of the regulator is this authorization architecture which uh, is your, your access control decision. Uh, and this is driven by a set of static rules. And uh, the static rules basically capture um, when you would consider it appropriate for a given uh, processing to happen, right? So uh, they may take the form that, uh, or if you have a certain consent of a certain type, if you have a certain kind of approvals, then you would allow uh, this particular TE to uh, receive data of this particular type and send output to this uh, requester whose credentials I just changed. And of course, uh, the uh, framing of these rules uh, has to be uh, driven from a prior privacy risk assessment of the TEs that were um, uploaded for approval and also in the privacy risk assessment of the various data types that they uh, are um, um, asking to uh, process, right? Uh, and uh, so this is the static rules part of the authorization architecture, uh, but um, dynamically at runtime, uh, you have this dynamic authorization architecture, which depends on uh, first of all, these consent and approvals from uh, various individuals and secondly um, authentication of uh, not just uh, the individuals themselves but also the TEs whether uh, you are actually running this particular TE or not and this is uh, exactly the remote authentication or remote attestation uh, part of it uh, and authenticating the data types whether the data type that you are actually going to see uh, is actually of the type uh, that you claim it to be. Uh, and uh, so that will basically cover the regulatory uh, architecture. And here I have a simple uh, workflow example uh, where, uh, you know, this patient uh, visits his doctor and the doctor wants to access the patient's data, but the um, uh, static rule in the regulator, uh, regulator's uh, privacy policy is that uh, unless a patient X has consulted with a doctor Y, uh, if the patient X says that this is actually true, only then you allow Y to access uh, this data type DT3, which uh, I have defined earlier. Uh, I think it means uh, to access um, all the medical uh, data of the um, individual. So only if these conditions hold true, then allow the doctor Y to access this data type uh, DT3 via this TE. So note that uh, no individual directly accesses data. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, in line with uh, what uh, we said earlier that uh, given the impossibility of absolute privacy, uh, the only recourse is that uh, uh, you don't allow uh, arbitrary access and processing of data. Uh, all access and processing should be controlled. And uh, this is what this static rule um, is trying to uh, achieve. Um, and here you, uh, there are just some steps on uh, signing the uh, consent statement, uh, which is, uh, so now note here that the patient is not consenting to uh, uh, to something after knowing uh, exactly what uh, processing this data controller will do, because it is really uh, meaningless to ask the patient uh, 
to do that what is meaningful is to ask him whether you did willingly go to this doctor or not and the rest uh, should be taken care of by uh, the static rules or the um, responsible um, privacy policy that this regulator has designed um, so uh, i think uh, this should be enough to give you an idea uh, of what uh, the architecture is um, i think i should break for uh, questions here um, and then i will move on to some other case studies as well uh in your current architecture you have proposed the rules right the rules are essentially what a regulator would define yes but uh, would there be a control for an individual to change these rules for example uh, the regulator could allow some decision to be left to the individual uh, right so um, that is kind of part of uh, this rules so you can make these rules as uh, modular as possible uh, if you want to do that Uh, but uh, um, honestly, it uh, brings back uh, brings us back to the question: how much control, or how much privacy, self management you want to give to the individuals themselves? Uh, so, so, if I may answer that question, what this will then require is a grammar, right? And um, so, this grammar of what part of the static rules uh, will require. will can be um, can be parameterized by the consent giver or the or the or the individual right so uh, like in this case we have just talked about an approval but the approval architecture can uh, you know through the same mechanism of the approval architecture the rules can even lead to special purpose special purpose condition checks that if this happens then allow access if this happens then don't allow access right so those can be parameterized by the approver and uh, depends on how complicated the grammar is or you know so you can design a full programming language for example for the static groups and uh, um yes so 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 you have to fire various rules under various conditions and uh, techniques for all of those exist thank you i i see more uh, people uh, wanting to ask questions i'm unmuting them one by one uh hey uh, abhishek this side so i just wanted to understand that uh, like regulator seems to be so for this architecture to work we need to trust on the regulator side so what would happen in case that trust is broken from the regulator side and the second case in which the regulator itself is compromised uh can i get access to the entire system because like everything works around uh, a key which is issued by the regulator itself Correct. Um, so, uh, Prashant, I may add one more question to that. What he essentially hinting at is, uh, you are proposing a regulator with, say, a bureaucrat who is going to handle this, but at some level, you are also proposing automated regulation, right? Where you are defining those Correct. rules. Correct. Uh, uh, what level of automated bureaucracy are we looking at? To if to uh, this, this is an addition question to what just Abhishek asked. Right. So I think there are two um, components to trust on the regulator. One is that uh, trust on uh, is in, uh, just and lawful policies themselves, and second is um, on the operational aspect of it. Whether uh, given that uh, you know the policies themselves are fine and uh, the TEs that you are approving are fine. uh whether uh, the actual operational code is uh, adhering to uh, those privacy policies and the tees that were approved um so i think the um, second uh, point which is the operational aspect of it can be easily done by just uh, uh, doing the same approach recursively so basically um, all the uh, tees that you approve and all the policies that you approve you make them uh, public right and then at that point uh, and you sign them uh, anybody can check uh, at any point whether uh, all these uh, regulatory um, operations are also happening within a te so uh, can are they actually authenticated so anybody else can also do a remote authentication on uh, 
any of the regulatory components themselves that will give you uh, and uh, i think this um, practically this may be an internal process at the regulator itself uh, but if you want uh, or if uh, in the situation demands it, it could be potentially made public also um, in terms of what um, kind of programs you are approving what privacy policies uh, you are allowing them uh, and so on and so forth so i see that at some level this is the whole issue of bringing in proof right uh, through cryptography absolutely can i can i add on so uh, you know so for example in this case the regulator cannot access the data the data is with the uh, data controller so the regulator can do if the regulator is untrustworthy what he can do is that he can mount a denial of service attack right not allow any access um, and uh, so on so forth or do random attacks that allow random accesses and so on so forth. so our one fundamental assumption is that the data controller and the regulator won't collude but if they do collude then the standard solution to that in computer science is to have multiple regulator and do uh, um, uh, multi party computation so you can say that at least two regulators or at least three regulators have to do a threshold computing two out of three will have to grant this access before this access is granted this is something that you do routinely in say electronic voting and so on so forth or for decryption so at least two people must allow a decryption out of three or some majority or a threshold rule before before this can happen right so that extension from a one regulator to a multiple regulator is standard in computer science you know it can it can immediately be proved in the major part of all this is a proof that uh, so you have to get in a proof system uh, in this communication between the regulator and the uh, and the and the data controller so the data controller will have to prove purpose will have to prove authentication will have to prove authentication of tees to a regulator before a consent is granted now question is that it is an online architecture yes conceptually can this be implemented theoretically yes practically is going to be very very difficult right so our purpose is not to suggest a practical implementation immediately our purpose is to lay out the standards of what is required for privacy protection so i would argue that if you don't do this you know regulatory access control then theoretically you cannot protect privacy if cannot if you make the don't make the regulator online and don't have access control then data will invariably leak sooner or later uh, through insider attacks through security breaches and so and uh, once somebody has access to the data personally identifiable data privacy protection is impossible so um, you know there is no absolute guarantee to privacy once the data is out in the public domain so strict access control is sort of essential and you know so the question is how far will you go now that's a political decision that um, whether you want to do this uh, tam dham you know so much of it or you want to do parts of it and so on so forth but this lays a standard that if you want to have full access control then something like this architecture with a remote secure remote execution is necessary if the regulator is untrustworthy then you have to bring in multiple regulators and symmetric multi party communication uh, computation so you have to have threshold computation that at least two or three people must agree before a computation is allowed yeah okay i have one more question from suhan yeah uh, the professor banerjee's explanation on multi uh, regulate uh, multiple regulators and threshold proof systems and things like that actually just clarifies the question and thank you hello yeah yeah yeah. So I, another, yeah yeah i have another one so uh, i feel that this uh, architecture revolves around the regulator instead of the individual or the data owner so what sort of access rights or uh sort of policies can an individual data owner make on the platform so for example what if i want to delete my data from the platform itself and what if uh like will the regulator play any role in that particular things as well what if i want to modify it what what if i don't want to give any sort of access to any doctor because it's my personal data so you know do that, i need to get approval from the regulator to do that yes because you don't give consent and the regulator won't give access so that depends on the static rules right so what the static rules the um, the use cases define 
So every use case will define sort of static rule, and the static rule is what will give the individuals the power. So individuals are just parameters in the static rule, right? So uh, in individual is a X in the static rule. So individuals have to provide an ID, and uh, you know if the static rules give individuals large powers for data deletion, then the individuals will be able to do it. If the static rules Don't give those powers, and the individual will not be able to do it. So, your privacy protection architecture is primarily designed by the authorization architecture. That what every actor is authorized to do. So, what we are saying is that that this will change from situation to situation, application to application. But whatever it is, it has to be laid out entirely, transparently, completely out in the public. Right? The static authorization rule. Is an encoding of your regulation, you know, your laws, right? So what Sanjeev was talking about yesterday, they are capturing the law and logic as a set of conditions or programs. So these will have to be fixed, analyzed, assessed before an application is completely rolled out and also modified, right? As as you go on, but whatever the static rules permit. The individual will be able to do, right? Whatever the static rules don't permit, the individual will not be able to do. So individuals will appear as parameters. So static rule will say that X can delete the data if X is X meets this condition. Now X is an individual, right? So X put, puts his credential, and if those credentials meet those conditions, then and if the rule permits, then he'll be allowed to delete the data. That's the way it will look. So it's a grammar-based. Uh, Predicated situation, and who would create these access rules? Will will it I be that? That will have to be the regulator. Yeah. So we are saying that a regulatory capacity is sort of crucial out there. Regulator or a set of, uh, you know, yeah. So these rules they arrive with the regulator. They have to uh, be made by the regulator, and we can demand that the regulator makes it public, signs it, and makes it public. And the regulator cannot change these rules without announcing it in the public. You know, a blockchain will do that, for example. Okay. Okay. I, I see there are some people who have questions in the chat. Do any of you want to directly ask those questions to Prashanta to Professor Subhash Panerji? Just please raise your hands. Uh, but okay, there is Devyank. Uh, hi. So my question is basically what I've put in the chat. Uh, your overall architecture places a data controller at the center. Uh, is this assumption sort of flexible? So can these trusted executables, for example, execute on an edge or something controlled by a client, uh, so that there's sort of uh, less reliance on these static rules? Uh, are you aware of any such approaches, or do you have any opinions on this? um i'm sorry the young time uh, i followed in can you refill uh no so i think that is about edge devices right so um you know for example the example that prashant gave uh, he assumed that a trusted executable must run on the doctor's terminal right so this is a very serious requirement so he says a te doc now that's a that's a doctor's terminal so he is assuming that the regulatory boundary extends all the way to the doctor's terminal so that we, what what this would mean is that the doctor cannot access the data using any laptop that he owns right so this has to be a laptop that is approved by the regulator and the regulator must have an ability to run a uh, do a remote execution on this laptop you know so this has to be an approved uh, access device and the data that goes out to the doctor will have to only be suitably minimized right so he can look at graphs he can look at tables but cannot store anything on his hard disk cannot um, cannot uh, so the regulator will have to ensure and the doctor will have to give a proof that the doctor while accessing the patient's data is not transmitting out through the network or is not accessing the hard disk to um, to, to dump the data on his on his local disk he is just viewing it from a terminal so of course you can take a photograph i mean that can't be prevented but that won't scale right so 
Yes, so I think that for this, so so the question is that do you want it or do you not want it? It depends on to what extent you need to go to privacy privacy. But if you don't want the data to go out at all, then even edge devices will have to come under regulatory control. And um, so the data controller in this case, uh, uh, you know, there are multiple data controller actually. The doctor's terminal is a, is actually a part of a data controller. And uh, so the question is that there can be multiple data controller, but all of them must be under regulatory supervision, regulatory oversight, right? And um, uh, uh, one regulator or a, or a team of regulators, yeah, as the, as the situation demands. Yeah, that's what the architecture is proposing. I think Divyang uh, has a follow-up question. Yeah, sorry, slight follow-up. Uh, so yeah, what you said about the edge devices makes sense, but in this uh, diagram that's sort of on the screen right now, mm. uh, this data controller and a database is at the center of it, uh, and so is the regulator. So this seems like a more regulator-centric architecture. Uh, are you aware of any approaches where a user or a patient sort of retains a custodianship of their data and I sort of that, uh, the know, rules start from there? So even in this, the patient request, so, so this is, you know, so like what Malvika started out with, that this architecture assumes that you don't want to do for privacy self-management. And the reason is that if I'm a patient, um, you know, even as a professor of computer science, when I'm ill and with, I'm going with a stomach upset or God forbid COVID, I don't want to worry about architectures, right? So I would like somebody to, somebody else uh, so uh, to take care of it. So this is an accountability based framework and not an individual based framework. So the individual in this situation just gives a concern that I'm meeting this doctor, right? I am going to the, this doctor with this complaint and then a set of regulatory rules fire, right? That uh, whether the doctor's access is legitimate given that uh, kind of doctor he is, and the kind of patient this is, you know, for example, if I'm born with a throat com complaint um, and you are asking for a genetic profile, then one of the regulatory static rules should prevent it, right? Um, now, whether um, it is meaningful to ask a patient that do you allow this test or you don't allow this test, right? Um, I think the regulatory framework would be better formed by some ICMR guidelines rather than asking individual patients. So. The privacy self-management uh, obligation on the patient is a little low out here. And we have an accountability-based framework to the regulator. You know, that's what we are proposing. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just going to quickly ask a follow-up, uh, maybe add a comment. Uh, sorry for jumping in. Uh, but I'm also thinking that, you know, the, the question of whether the individual trumps, is that the question that you have this kind of system that's running in the background and can the in individual at any one come any point come in and trump a static rule? Is that the question? I think yes. Uh, and again, that's something we would need to agree that, you know, do we want to, and potentially, yeah, there would always be some kind of right in relation to personal, sensitive personal data like health records, but I suppose. So in this case, the regulator, the only way the individual can trump is by revoking consent. That is always possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anush, uh, yeah. you're up. Yeah. I just want to understand a bit around the identity authority. I assume that it is going to be, it's going to generate virtual identities, but uh, how, as in, do you see it working outside of this? You, you mentioned that it is an independent authority. So is it independent in general? And if, if that is the case, then is it going to be as in how do you see it working out in reality? I think uh, it should be independent of the regulator, um, you know, and uh, independent. Uh, of, and of course, it should, uh, it should, it should use anonymous credentials. It should use virtual identities, uh, for, you know, all the data minimization principles, right? Um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, there are identity authorities that are based on those principles. You know, you have these uh, uh, 
what are they called these blockchain based identity management uh, systems that do anonymous credential chomp style and uh, that do zero knowledge proofs and uh, uh, that do virtual identities uh, so uh, we have not designed an identity authority um, so we assume that there is one such identity authority which is capable of doing anonymous credentials and virtual identities yes okay but you haven't given a thought as to you know how this identity authority is going to be managed in the sense that is it going to be centralized or especially in a public infrastructure in a public infra right you know so so we have a lot of thought on it you know i think that the management centralized is uh, um, not a problem i think if you look at estonia their identity authority is managed on a blockchain the blockchain is multiple centralized right so is only the control that is distributed but the storage is centralized so um, that seems to be the most common model uh, there are uncommon models like aadhaar uh, but you know i think that the centralization is not the issue i think the biggest the management of an identity authority is not a, not a, not a big problem i think computer science knows how to solve that problem what is almost unsolved and difficult about an identity authority is the generation of the identity from where do you get your identity like you know for example in aadhaar it comes from biometric and i'll have a lot to say about against it so that is the difficult problem that you know what makes your identity and that is an as yet an unsolved problem in computer science and i'm not going to address it uh, right out here but once an identity is somehow established the management of that identity is uh, in a transparent way in a provable way uh, that can also be put under a similar regulatory oversight uh, for the identity authority will have its own regulator or a set of regulators that will monitor it it will have its own trusted executables that dish out anonymous credentials and uh, does authentication so uh, yeah so some such architecture can be done what is difficult and i have no answers for is what is the origin of the identity now that's a that's a tough question to answer right thank you okay uh, i think srikant has a question yeah uh, so i'll quickly divide it into multiple parts so this uh, by uh, by understanding what i get is this is a surveillance less design uh, but is there a less surveillance design because i am just being practical here in the sense that we cannot or we will not probably have an environment where uh, a surveillance less design is kind of politically approved uh, so is there a possibility of a less surveillance system here so that's one and the other thing is uh, we have seen that there have been multiple stated and unstated interests so even in the case of your dbt example the reason why we chose to have a centralized aadhar mapper and uh, the dbt infrastructure that we have today as against the model that you proposed is that there was an unstated aim or even in some cases it is even understated aim of serving uh, micro credit uh, to these uh, subsidies as a guarantee and that was basically part of the problem which uh, your approach did not kind of answer so basically if you add more requirements then the solution has to be slightly different so in, in which case how do we design something where the requirement which could be a policy of the government uh, would keep on changing now tomorrow another government can come and change that this digital infrastructure must serve me this goal and how does one design uh, when when the policy context is dynamic uh and then uh, the last question is how do we kind of design this uh, in, in terms of cost because the current uh, systems uh by being centralized in nature and uh, data inclusive they do uh, make a case that they are uh, cost effective or the least cost solution uh, whereas in, in the case of yours uh, you propose a, a hardware uh, based model plus uh the cost of identity issuance which you said you've not uh, i mean you you mentioned that the identity issuance is not something that you focus too much but identity issuance will be a costly affair especially if you're going to into the virtual identity zone so how do we get the cost uh, right. um, you know i'll 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 answer and i think there is some misunderstanding about the objective out there so let me clarify by first saying that any application that you build and the scope extension of that application is a political issue as it should be right it should never be a technical issue that whether you want to build an electronic health record um is not a technical question at all it's a it's always a political question now whether you want to build a dbd system it's again a political system question 
whether you want to extend its function, uh, do purpose limitation or purpose extension. Yes, this, this is something that will also have to be politically uh, settled. This cannot be technically settled. So, uh, you know, that is a far more interesting problem than what we are proposing. Now, once you have declared the purpose, and this is the current purpose, right? So, so now any unintended purpose extension is what we are talking about, should be prevented, right? So you state that you're extending and then you, then you extend, you know, win politically and then you extend and nobody can prevent it in a democracy. So given that you have got a certain purpose definition, if you try to extend the function via function creep, like without passing a law, that is the obligation of the regulator to prevent. And we are suggesting a method of preventing that, right? We are actually not even suggesting a method of preventing that. We are, you know, we are never saying that this should be implemented. This diagram should be implemented as is. We are putting out this diagram as a method of understanding the privacy problem, right? We completely understand that this is unimplementable because of its complexity, right? I mean, where will you get such a regulator who will be able to do all this, right? So uh, we are not advocating immediately that you build this identity authority, you build this regulator and you build up this way. But I am, I, we are suggesting that you look at this diagram and use it as a yardstick of to what extent the privacy goal you have met. So if your regulator function falls short of what we are proposing, there will be certain function, this privacy compromise. For example, if your regulator static rule is what defines the purpose. If those static rules can be changed arbitrarily by the regulator itself or by somebody else, then there's a function creep. So we are saying that you have to build technology and and, and, and law instruments so that this regulator makes the static rules. These are publicly viewable. These are untamperable, unchangeable, without an explicit signed action by the regulator, which is visible to everybody. So unless you have this, there will be certain privacy compromise. So every time you dish out a system, whether it's DBT, whether it's Aadhaar, whether it's an identity system, whether it's an electronic health record, uh, this diagram will help you to understand that where is the compromise line? Is it in data minimization? Is it in a function creep to the regulatory action or all the static rules completely laid out? Or uh, is something missing? Or are you being unable to make the static rules public? Or can the regulator change the static rules uh, surreptitiously? You know, all of these entail privacy risk, right? So we are saying that to have a complete guarantee for purpose limitation, this is the requirement. If you don't meet this requirement, purpose extension will happen. You cannot guarantee that there'll be no purpose extension, right? Purpose violation, function creep, and all that should happen. So the way to do purpose limitation is to capture the stated purpose and the laws through a set of regulatory rules as a programming language, right? Which should be visible to everybody. Put it up on a blockchain perhaps, right? I mean, commit it as a cryptographic commitment and then the regulator cannot go back on it, right? So this is what is required. Whether this can be implemented? Probably not, right? It'll be sort of very hard except in a, except in a, except in a small system. But what we are saying is that, that through this, through this operationalization, the privacy landscape becomes becomes completely clear, right? That you have to make you have to make your regulatory boundary go up to those devices. You have to have the right kind of anonymized credentials. You you know every time you have to do a data exchange, you have to evaluate the amount of number of bits of information that you are leaking, and the static rules tell you that what is the purpose extension that you are doing. Now, whether you can change the static rules. That's a political process, as it should be, always, right? So you change law and then change the static rules. Yeah, that's what we are. That's what we are saying. If I can just quickly just add on to that as well. I mean, uh, just on the uh, regulator's discretion itself. I mean, I think this is where the technical and the regulatory architecture need to go together. 
because uh, there there are things in the pdp bill which will continue to be fleshed out which is why you know we need like a kind of joint approach to this uh, some of the basic institutional design mechanisms which are in place even if you have a regulator because even they are bound by certain uh, and i don't mean computer science rules but general rules there are certain discretion fettering mechanisms the design of the board of the regulator the operating manual that is passed for the regulator in the first few months that it's set up where it literally you know it states that um, every change that i make in relation to say if if such a system were to exist if i was going to manipulate and change those rules i would need to publish them if i was going to make regulatory rules there is a need for say public consultation right that's why we all have these public consultations those are all coming from certain um, uh, discretion fettering requirements that operate across all regulators and i think that uh, to one extent it is how that regulator is set up uh, the cho- choice of the person is the political uh, question there uh, from there we already have some kind of uh, levers within the existing law and hopefully in the future regulation where you can start uh, setting on the regulator the constraints uh reg- are the consensus rules regarding when they can change when they when they can change rules when they shouldn't even within such a system um so i mean i don't i don't know if that was helpful but i think um even the political questions to some extent do have fettering mechanisms through um existing regulation in terms of how such a regulator could act when it changes something or chooses to or not okay uh, suhan you are up uh, uh, this is for uh, professor banerjee of malvika i just had a this uh, architectural diagram is basically a logic filter to see whether a uh, purpose limitation happens or privacy is working or not uh, now looking at it from an implementation perspective i'm just throwing out an idea that Uh, this could perhaps be implemented in a very very modular distributed architecture type of framework uh, possibly and uh, should therefore the role of a of what a dpa as in like the super oversight regulator kind of be uh, someone who just orchestrates uh, you know logic filters vis-a-vis privacy uh, to see whether it's actually working in the various domains and various sectors and uh, matching up to certain principles and that should be the core function of the state or a dpa appointed by the state because the regulators could perhaps also be sectoral uh, folks uh, you know or other uh, sectoral regulators or say even an industry association or a, a self regulatory org- organization it, uh, so any thoughts on that from you professor banerji or madhavika so i would say depending on the situation the regulatory the regulator can be a um, you know a, it can be self regulatory if, if it's a small government department uh, it can be a like you know in iit um, we have got an audit that prevents us from purchasing the way we want and they're pretty adversarial they don't allow us to do anything at all i, th- I sometimes think that they are just too antagonistic so within the organization regulator can work you know in some cases but if you are building something like an electronic health record i would i would advocate external regulators directly under the control of a dpa if you are building an identity system national level identity system i would advocate the same that you have to go through a a, a multi regulatory um, system which is outside the organization uh, you know you cannot you cannot you know within regulatory within and same same authority uh can work in smaller system but for very large system that's why that's probably not a not a not a such a great idea but this architecture allows for both now regarding the implementation possibility i think that this architecture can be implemented today with some small caveats uh you know we have not done a stress testing but i think that the sgx technology is pretty uh, well established so you can do this remote execution you have commitments enough cryptographic tools uh so that such a system can be built now the question is who can build it right uh, definitely an academic can build a small system but whether it can be built at a national scale then this is not a, just a technical question it's also a capacity question and i think that there will be several challenges in building building such a thing and you have to do an overall scaling and and so on so forth. but this particular paper that's not the objective the objective is to uh, 
you know, is to roll out the privacy landscape and to say that what is necessary for a privacy protection, what is sufficient for a privacy protection, and so that you can have a benchmark of, of, of what is required for privacy. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So at some level, what you're proposing is very uh, technology implementation that still needs to be adapt adapted for specific needs of an individual department, right? But what you are witnessing currently right now within the country is uh, at some level, you're copy pasting whatever Estonia has done. Uh, but you are also at the same time trying and plugging in these other uh, interests like Srikanth was mentioning, for example, microfinance is an interest. And when you look at, say, the whole issue of Aroke Setu, we suddenly see electronic health records have been plugged into it as an interest. And uh, contact tracing was... While it could have been the primary interest, you have a secondary interest which has been attached. Uh, so what would it take, say, to review some of these upcoming infrastructures? I'm, spe I'm specifically asking you about the whole India enterprise architecture, uh, which, which I believe the standards for it are out and we are already building them. So I would say that even if you have to question such a thing, right? Um, so suppose you don't like it, you don't like Aragya Setu or you don't like uh, the, the note thing that you're talking about, right? Uh, I don't like the use case and the utility, but suppose the use case, suppose we grant it that there's a use case and there's a utility, but you don't like the implementation because you think that there's a privacy leakage risk. You know, then even as, a, as an opponent, uh, you have to ask the right questions and the right questions are, the right questions are, we are saying that, do they have access control? Do they have purpose limitation? Right? Do they have access control rules that are transparent? What is providing the access control? You know, if, it, if you're saying that my hardware security module is providing the access control, I'll say no. Right? Hardware security module, which is controlled by the same authority, and you're putting encryption under the key, it does not produce an iota of access control. So, you know, so if somebody throws out that I've got encryption, I've got a hardware security module, right? I think that this diagram will help you question that and will say that, no, that's neither necessary nor sufficient. Is that right? So, for example, in Aragya Setu, so they are saying that there are some tokens that are getting exchanged, right? When, uh, when there's Bluetooth. The question is that, do they satisfy the properties of anonymous credentials? They have not said that. When it goes up to the to the central server, right? Suppose I am COVID positive, my data goes up to the central server. Do they have an access control? Who is regulating that access control? What is the guarantee that there is a purpose limitation, right? What is the purpose limitation architecture? So I would say that those are the questions to ask. And what we are trying to say is that, that once you take this architectural view, even if the solutions don't become obvious, the questions become obvious that these are the issues because we are arguing that this is both necessary and sufficient. So we are saying that if you don't have any of these components, there is a privacy compromise, right? And if you have these components, then you have taken care of privacy in, in to, a, to, a, to a large extent, right? So we are trying to say that, uh, uh, you know, so anytime anybody pushes out something like an Aragya Setu or this, that or the other, you need an yardstick to be able to evaluate that. Right. Otherwise, you say that, you know, you are leaking privacy. They say, no, we have encryption. You know, that argument doesn't get anywhere. You, you say that I have, uh, you know, I am worried about data leaks. They say that, no, we are anonymized the data. So I am saying that this argument, as we have seen in the Aadhaar judgment also, these arguments are inconclusive. Chandrachun will say one thing and uh, Justice Bhushan will say something else altogether and they'll be contradictory. Right. And I think that that, to prevent that from happening, uh, you need the questions to be specific, the yardstick to be defined, that under what yardstick are you uh, measuring the privacy? You know, I think Srikant asked a question about function tree. How do you prevent it? You prevent it through the static rules of the regulator, right? How often does it change? What are the, what guarantees do you have against it changing? 
So um, yeah, so I think that that's that's what you're saying. That so even in, in simple terms, I would put it that you're trying to bring in evidence-based policy or governance mm -hmm. that is lacking in technical systems that are being built. Yeah. Yes, I would. I would agree. Okay, I think we are uh, almost near to the end of the session. I will open it up for anyone to like come up and talk. I'll, I'm allowing people to unmute themselves. Uh, please come in. If you have any questions, please free, feel free to ask. So if you have anything that you want to bring up, please go ahead. If nobody has any of these questions, maybe I should ask this. Uh, do you want more of this? Uh, I mean, discussions are on the intersection of both the technicalities and as well as the uh, governance side of these, the regulatory side of uh, these systems. Because there are more systems that are coming up, like while Professor Panerji described an ideal scenario for data protection and how to build such a system in both technology and regulatory systems. Yes, Rahul, you can unmute yourself. You can come back. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Srinivas. Uh, hi, Professor Banerjee. Um, I have a question over here, which is, uh, and I think you, you sort of answered it, but uh, I wanted to get a little specific about it because there's something I don't understand about uh, this architecture or rather how, how you've laid it out, how Prashant uh, and, and everybody else has laid it out over here. Uh, and I'm wondering where it fits in in the larger scheme of things. So um, if there is resistance or a challenge to the way things have been described over here in this particular uh, depiction over here, this diagram, where do, you see, uh, where do you see the resistance to this idea coming from? Um, I see that, um, you know, it will be hard to implement given the, you know, where do you build such regulatory capacity or where do you build such data controller capacity, right? So I think that the uh, first question is that. The second is that what are the technologies that you can use to build it? You know, moment you talk about trusted executables, uh, how do you implement trusted executables? Do you use homomorphic encryption that will make it too slow? Or do you use SGX, which are known to have side channel attacks, right? So, uh, so the question is that uh, who will implement it? Using what tools will you implement it? Uh, those are the standard questions uh, that will that will come up. Uh, this is not very easy to to implement for sure. Uh, you know, like somebody asked yesterday that programming zero knowledge proofs or programming anonymous credentials. There is no capacity available in the in the industry. So where do you get such programmers who can program all this? I admit, you know, all the, all of that is all of that is uh, all of that is true. So the way I see it is that that this defines um, a set of challenges for computer science researchers, such as uh, my colleagues in the department. So if SGX has a problem, either performance or security wise, it is up to them to research and show it. So they have to make this trusted executables implementable, fast, reliably, and a whole lot of techniques will come in. They're already coming in. Uh, SGX is pretty matured, and uh, but you know they, they will have to come. Regulatory capacity, you know, so programming capacity to build this, you know, slowly build up only if people are convinced. If people are not convinced, they're not going to build up uh, very easily. So. Uh, you know, people can program difficult things, uh, but not in cryptography. That's because cryptography is not very common um, in public life and, and, and so on and so forth. But the question is as follows, that if you don't do this, you know, if you don't understand that access control is central to privacy protection, right? Uh, and the anonymization is not. And if you don't have an architecture for purpose uh, limitation, then function creeps are inevitable. Like Srikant asked that question, you know, DVT started out with one objective and uh, there's a hidden agenda. And so the hidden agenda to come in will require a function creep, right? The only way to prevent that is to have a, have a regulatory code, right? If you don't have that and the, you know, then the function creep is sort of inevitable. So this is what is required, you know? So we have argued it is necessary, 
we have weakly argued that it is sufficient and i think we i'll hone up the argument to say that this is also uh, also sufficient so an ideal situation will require something like this whether you can implement this today you know i have my doubts uh, but uh, but i am a researcher so i am not so much bothered about the question of whether you can implement it today you know but tomorrow perhaps yes understood thank you uh, next we have uh, suhan yeah uh, professor banerji i uh, do you think that like the chinese great firewall on information and things like that uh, that also has automated systems and uh, human beings looking at the system uh, on a real time basis continuously obviously has elements uh, of this in terms of static rules uh, etc that would allow certain pieces of information in or sensor certain pieces of information etc is that um, uh, which is applied in the censorship domain not in the privacy framework but is an architecture something like this would that be a real world example at scale which may be similar using similar logic you know i know very little about china i've been there twice but i from what i read from the newspaper i get a dystopian picture of the thing i don't think that they have regulatory oversight at all i think that they are you know they are described as a system which are pretty um, intrusive and uh, you know for example no i mean it's i mean it's intrusive but with a logic based on this in terms of the regulator basically enables access uh, has access control and dynamic and static rules vis-a-vis -vis what type of information that you can allow in and out uh, of the uh, of the country or the internet environment that exists you know, so do you, uh, intuitively do you think it's this similar type of logic that they are uh, hard to say you know, for, example, uh, for example from a computer science perspective only i mean i i don't know from regulatory it's hard to say when you have got surveillance agencies you know for example it turns out that united states uh, had zero protection you know uh, uh, NSA, which is their main national security agency, could be breached by a, a temporary contractor, Snowden. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's an insider attack uh, of a mm -hmm. grave variety. Mm -hmm. And just that it happened shows that they had no access control restrictions, mm -hmm. none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Any insider could access it. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that if you have that, as Snowden has proved beyond all reasonable doubt, privacy protection is impossible if an insider can access things so easily. Mm -hmm. um, Now, when you're trying to do surveillance, such as in China, I think they are sitting on high-resolution uh, face images. Right? The, 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 the amount of um, street cameras that are, in, or indoor cameras that are capturing everything, is quite incredible. And there is quite a bit of surveillance that you can, do, you know, processing, uh, identification, re-identification. You can track individuals uh, pretty much. Now, the question is that who is allowed to do it? is there only one data controller that can do it or so that will depend on what kind of regulatory control they have so you know that somebody can do it itself is a is a problem for me that somebody can process all that uh, facial information and, uh, and 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 do it i think nobody should be able to do it but in china from mm. what i understand at least one data controller is able to do it mm. with multiple data controllers can do it at will is something i can't answer you know that would be really really scary if that is the case Okay, good. Right. Thank you, uh, Abhishek. Yeah. So, uh, like, I have seen there are like multiple security frameworks that are coming up right now, and uh, like uh, India Enterprise Architecture is one of them, when uh, in which it talks about how to handle security and everything at a very uh, not a coarse grain, uh, but uh, just an overview. So, I just have a doubt. Maybe any of you can answer it. Ki how can we like converge and uh, make it a unified sort of model when it comes to security or securing our systems especially on the government side because if we have so many systems uh, and every department or the organization within the government itself is working independently on its own architecture it becomes very difficult to even interoperate and to be scalable and then to uh, uh, make sure that the system is like really really secure you know i think the security is distinct from privacy uh, so security does not give you privacy for example right uh, at all 
security i would say is a necessary condition for privacy but privacy requires much much more than security uh, security is of two types right so one is securing against external attacks so for example you have got a system sitting in an ic can i attack it from outside right um i think there are standard techniques available with the government and nic to prevent any attack so you have got sophisticated firewalls intrusion detection system so thwarting external attacks reasonably well is a very well understood and very well established technology right and i think that the government or various arms of the government uh, can definitely do that when it comes to government the security threat and also the privacy threat is not external it's internal you know internal can happen in two ways uh, one is the organization itself goes rogue right and um, does starts doing surveillance or purpose extension or purpose violation that uh, it is not supposed to do that's an that's an organizational insider threat and second is certain compromise individuals within the organization uh, does get access like snowden did nsa didn't want to leak the data but snowden wanted to leak the data so security the big security risk are always insider this is never external risks right so whether the government uh, is even thinking of insider security risk you know when they talk about it i get the impression that they don't they don't even consider that as a problem and you know, at least for all the say to when they talk about security risk you know they are talking about external security risk you know nobody would attack and government server uh, from outside you know it's much easier to kidnap somebody's daughter point a gun right you know those are far far simpler things than attacking a cisco firewall so um, so you need security protections against insiders most of it and how do you do it you will need access control you need very strong access control mechanism and i would argue that putting an hardware security module and saying i have got access control is simply not going to uh, simply not going to work so you need a regulated access control to be able to prevent insider attacks and uh, access control is a crucial requirement for privacy and security both right so access control is a security but purpose limitation is not a security problem it's a it's a privacy problem and uh, they are slightly different so so do you think a citizen centric uh, security model would be better uh, like considering this internal risk and is it the right time to do it so for example like i like uh, cryptography and so, so for example just take a case of blockchain uh, if i tell someone who is not technically uh no who does not technically know how this system works and how do i sign or how do i use a system or a software to digitally sign and do a transaction uh it will be very difficult for those people to actually access the system so if i shift from a regulator based system to a citizen centric based system will it be scalable in india are people ready for it you know i think you cannot make a regulator centric system you know that is a, a that doesn't sound right you know every system that you build will have to be citizen side uh, you know there is no other way to build system public system right they have to be for citizens you know no. they cannot keep a, uh, so when i say citizen centric i mean giving uh, the entire 100% right to the citizen instead of having a centralized authority around it you know i would think that uh, the system should be citizen centric in terms of uh, you should not put any hurdles um to access information or get services right so if you do digital signatures there has to be very very simple use cases if you can't design such use cases don't build such systems you know so uh, that is very 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 simple that you cannot do digitization to disenfranchise that's a that's a that's the first rule but that's a use case too it is it is possible to design simple use cases for complicated cryptographic notions right i think that there have been several examples where extremely difficult cryptographic um, constructs have very very simple and intuitive use cases from the perspective of the user the question is that that how much obligation do you put on the user for privacy self management right i would think that given uh, the education level asking a an user to do the privacy self management right is probably not right i would like a more accountability based system 
So if you are collecting my data, then irrespective of my consent, it is your responsibility to protect my data. Right? And you cannot take a consent from me that will harm me. Right? I think that is a that's a fundamental unethical thing that you cannot take a consent um, that I have taken your consent that it will do this and that will that will result in harm in some some potential way. So I would say that the data, the person, the, the, the organization that is collecting the data should have a responsibility and an accountability uh, that goes beyond consent. And, uh, you know, the, the consent, that, that is not to say that consent doesn't play a role or the privacy self-management doesn't play a role. But it cannot be the sole role. The privacy cannot be the sole responsibility of, a, of an individual. You know, if you ask me to protect my privacy, uh, maybe I can. But, you know, that will make me look at the program of the Android phone that I, I bought. And I may not want to do that. You know, I want to buy an Android phone on trust. Right? Um, so if I have to question every bit of it, if I have to disassemble every app and check what it is doing, or run to a colleague, uh, you know, and ask uh, her to disassemble this app before I download. That is not the way to protect privacy. You know, that is putting too much obligation on an individual and most individuals, even computer scientists, will not be able to do it, will fall short. You know, we are, we, you know, I trust the Apple phone. I trust the Apple MacBook, right? And if I, if I have to examine every part of it, um, it like becomes very, very, um, very, very difficult. So I think that the obligation will primarily will have to be on a data controller and a regulatory authority to protect most of my privacy. That's what I would say. Okay. Thanks. Th th there is one question in the chat, uh, which is, uh, can this architecture be built into existing projects like, say, public credit registry or, uh, say, national health stack? Uh, do you suggest entirely replacing them with this logic? What are the major gulfs to cross it if this has to be uh, integrated into the ongoing projects? I think that the considerations are very different. So I don't think that an ongoing project, um, you know, you can retrofit such a model into an ongoing project very easy. So I, you know, that, that is an engineering aspect that will have to be um, looked at in a great detail, but I would say that it will not be very easy to retrofit it in this model. Second question is that whether this model, how much it will scale that itself is in doubt. You know, the diagram that you see in front of you, whether we can build a prototype, yes. You know, I'm pretty confident that we can build a prototype. Prashant can build a prototype fairly fast. But whether the prototype will work at a national scale, you know, that is, nobody can answer that. You know, that will require years of, um, testing, stress testing, scaling, and so on and so forth. So that's a, that's a big ongoing project. What we are trying to say is right now that this is the way to look at privacy, right? So privacy should be looked at in terms of these ingredients. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we are trying to say primarily. Professor Banerjee, just um, uh, follow up uh, to that question. That was mine actually. Uh, I mean, why can't it, be retrofitted. That's actually the crux of my question. So where are the major gulfs? Is it the accountability versus the consent model or where uh, is the deal? I think that uh, we are not used to looking at a regulator this way with an online presence. Right. So that itself is a problem. Uh, the regulatory capacity building is, is a problem. Programming the architecture in this way will require a pretty high performing remote execution environment. Right. The remote execution environments that we know uh, are uh, things like SGX and so on and so forth. They have not really been tested at a scale of, say, Aadha, or scale of, say, national health records, and so on and so forth. So whether, you know, so for secure remote execution, you will have some overheads. Now, whether the overheads are... Um, can be absorbed in a very large application that will have to be evaluated. Uh, also, um, you know, every time Intel has put out SGX, somebody has come up with an attack. So this is a, so those attacks are very difficult, very, very tricky attacks, but there are attacks, right? So constantly there are attacks that are coming up. Now, whether the SGX can be 
implemented securely for for something like an electronic health record you know that will have to be again again completely evaluated um, but if you don't have an hcx and if you don't have a remote execution environment at all and yet go ahead and implement a electronic health record system or a national digital identity system i would argue that you will not be able to implement access control so such a system will always have a privacy risk of access control right and uh, if you don't have a online regulator you will not be able to implement purpose limitation and there will always be a possibility of a function creep so i am saying that while there are existing systems that take care of privacy to some extent things like access control function creep are always possibilities with those implementations and this is something that we have to bear in mind and to prevent this you need a regulatory architecture of this stuff you know that's what we are trying to argue uh, whether we can build it today i am not sure I mean, I, I just uh, quickly to come in. This is Malavika, and I see that uh, Shrikant has also mentioned the uh, public regist credit registry actually sees a regulator as being part of the data infrastructure, um, and that is interesting actually because they that whatever we can see from the task force report and uh, some of the very high level specs that have been put out, uh, that they are supposed to have such a regulator. I think what is um, what is not clear to us from that report and maybe that is some aspects of this model could be looked at right i think they have got this purpose based access control but it's not clear clear whether there are dynamic access control lists there and what is the monitoring post uh, post having your uh, access level certified by the regulator and also aspects of the encryp uh, encryption standards for that and uh, Um, any safeguards like professor banerjee was saying against insider attacks right those kinds of things are from what we can see publicly are not yet visible in the pcr documentation and i think there are some aspects of this that could be taken across um i'm not, as as professor banerjee said and prashant mentioned like obviously the secure remote in execution environment creating that itself requires a lot more buy in but i understand that it is getting uh, i mean it's potentially the costs of that are dropping right professor banerjee just on a very feasibility point because i know we didn't get time to i think that uh, remote execution is available on every laptop and um, you know uh, arm trust zones are available on all android phones also uh, they don't let developers program it as uh, riju mentioned yesterday but i think that those will become more and more common and you'll see more and more use uh, and they will become better and better in the coming years right now if you buy a say apple laptop it will have a, a secure remote execution built into it or an android just, uh, yeah quickly make a point that uh, when we talk about remote execution uh, we also are assuming internet and in india that is not a given that's so, not a given. so so some of the issues are just like people are on cellular data and if you are doing crypto on cellular data you are just paying for a lot of bandwidth there so the the operational things are like it's not only the end devices so you might have a mobile phone which has trust zone you have this thing but the link in between is dropping and if you are a doctor's patient and in aims there are 500 people waiting after you you don't really want a internet connection and a remote execution to be going on there so there are really hard systems challenges that in india yeah, will face of course there are lots of those issues to think of my other concern is uh, you know now that the pcr question has come up and i have looked at pcr a little bit with malavika my major concern is that that um, you know if you go to rbi's uh, page on a white paper the level of detailing that is available is grossly unsatisfactory you know what are the privacy protection mechanism what is the utility preserving mechanism what is the performance that the thing will give and so on so forth so if you also look at their um, tender document you know when they when they when they give it out i have gone through the tender document it is the first version that was out there i think they are not giving out any design at all and i think that they are giving out a wish list and even the wish list is very very loosely specified so i would have an objection to building public infrastructure with that kind of a due diligence i would 
advocate that whenever you're trying to build something like that, the entire design, you know, first at a conceptual level, at, at various levels of granularity, at various levels of details, should be completely made public and be publicly available for scrutiny. Right, um, so that um, the various risks and so on and so forth can be well identified. I think that if you build such systems in clo under closed doors, um, there is a problem. And to the extent to which you can uh, take care of these concerns are, uh, are difficult. And I think that it is asking for trouble because you know you will build such a system, you'll, you will collect data around it, and then it will get into litigation and people will find problems with it and um, it will go to Supreme Court and it will be get, get uh, decided in some random ways. This is not the way to go about it at all. I think that public system and government systems need to be much more transparent in their design objectives and, and the design should be should be publicly available. So I, I have questions regarding the process by which the systems are built. Right? So I don't think that's something I'm comfortable with. Okay, I think we are almost at the end of it. Uh, Professor Banerjee, I think thank you for the cl clarifications that you had to give out that it's not, it, this does not include all the political side of the issues, for example, but you're only focusing on the technology side of things on the minimum set of things that one needs to ask when such these systems are being built. Uh, but I guess, you agree that there are a lot of these issues, especially with the tendering process that you mentioned. Uh, I, I guess more will happen over time where multiple people from multiple domains will critique in different ways. Uh, thank you on that note, but if, any, if nobody else has anything, I will end this. Okay, I will send you all the presentations and the recording by tomorrow. And uh, we will try to get one more posted sometime next month. And I guess August will be the third anniversary of the right to privacy judgment. We still don't have a data protection law. Yes. And let's see how long this will go on. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Srinivas. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.